We'll read this morning from the Old Testament prophecy of uh, Nehemiah, or history, I should say, of Nehemiah. Chapter 9 and from verse 5. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve them all, the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites and the Girgashites to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words, for you are righteous. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, and you heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of his land, for you knew that they acted proudly against them. So you made a name for yourself, as it is this day, and you divided the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land. And their persecutors you threw into the deep as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the road which they should travel. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven. You gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger. You brought them water out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding, uh, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them, even when they made a moulded calf for themselves, and said, This is our God, that brought you up out of Egypt, and worked great provocations. Yet in your manifold mercies you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart fr from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations, and divided them into districts. So they took possession of the land of Sion, the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You also multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, and brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to go in and possess, so the people went in and possessed the land. You subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they wished. And they took strong cities and a rich land and possessed houses full of all goods, cisterns already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and grew fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them to yourself. And they worked great provocations. Therefore, you delivered them into the hand of, your enemy, uh, of their enemies who oppressed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried to you, you heard from heaven. And according to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers who saved them from the hand of their enemies. 
Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us. Let's read this morning from uh, Psalm 36. Psalm 36. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes When he finds out his iniquity and when he hates, the words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He devises wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor evil. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like The great mountains, your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. And you give them drink from the rivers of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the workers of iniquity have fallen. They have been cast down and are not able to rise. What do you think about when you relax? When you've got spare time, to what does your mind gravitate? Maybe you're working in the car, uh, in the garden, or you're driving your car on a familiar route, and you're, or you're laying awake at night. What do you think about then? Does your mind habitually turn to the greatness of God and the grandeur of God? Does, does the promise of God come to your mind at such times as that, that he's with us, that he'll never forsake us, that he's working all things together for our good, that he's supplying all our need, that he's making all grace abound toward us. Do you think about these things? Do you think about the amazing fact that he's loved us from before the foundation of the world? When you let your thoughts, as it were, off the leash, and you let them run ahead of you, and you just follow them, do they instinctively take you to God? Do they invariably take you to God? In Psalm 36 here we have an insight, don't we, into two very different kinds of heart found amongst mankind, two descriptions of very different kinds of people. We have the typical man of the world spoken of in the first four verses. A man who knows nothing about the fear of God. He doesn't give God the time of day. He doesn't spare a thought for God. And all the while he's flattering himself that he is so mature, so competent, so wise. He's unaware of his own hypocrisy and his own deficiency and shortcomings. When he relaxes with a glass of wine in his hand perhaps, he thinks about what a successful man he is and how fulfilled his life is without God. He's made some money, he can make more, and he thinks then that he'll make himself richer than he already is. And then in verse 5, the picture changes completely and we have an insight into the thinking of a person who knows the living God. He's a righteous man, and we're told what his mind gravitates towards when he's relaxing, and when he's got nothing particular to think about. He thinks, verse 7, of God's love and kindness, his faithfulness, his righteousness, his justice, his providence, but especially his love. He's seen something of the glory of the Lord and he he treasures every thought of him. He thinks of God's loving kindness, how God, as it were, spreads his wings and bids sinners to come and take refuge under the shadow of the Almighty. He sees, we're told in verse 9, that the Lord has the fountain of life, and in God's light we see light, that God is righteous and loving, that there is such beauty and kindness in God that 
utterly satisfies him as he drinks from the rivers of God's pleasures. So the psalmist here looks at this poor sinner that he describes in the opening verses. He has no God, and yet the psalmist's Lord is glorious in his perfections, in his mercy, in his faithfulness, his righteousness, and his justice. So we've been looking for some months now at the various attributes and character of God. And uh, this morning I want us to think about this attribute that he speaks of in verse 7. The loving kindness of God. The unfailing love of God. Uh, which he tells us is precious. It's beyond price. You can't purchase it. You can only receive it as an amazing gift from God. Uh, it's, it's God's gracious gift. So we'll begin this morning with the most obvious question, really, isn't it? Uh, what is loving kindness? What does the Bible mean when it speaks to us about the loving kindness of the Lord? The Hebrew word uh, that it translates is the word hesed. It is the uh, most distinct and special word in the Old Testament, really. And it's, it's not possible for us to find an exact equivalent for it in the English language. It has a complexity and uh, a sort of uh, richness that can't really be captured in a, in a single word. There's that distinct Welsh word, isn't there? Hiraith, which means a longing to be in the place and with the people that we deeply love and to experience all the happiness that uh, our memories of them uh, bring to mind. There's, there's much more affection in the word hereith than in the English word homesickness, and that's the word that's usually used to translate that word. The word hesed is, is a bit like that. It's variously translated loving kindness or unfailing love or steadfast mercy. There are at least eight different words in English that we can use to translate this Hebrew word hesed. So recognizing the limitations of our language then, I want to begin by uh, highlighting the main elements of the loving kindness of the Lord. And the main elements are mercy, and loyalty and of course kindness itself. The loving kindness of God contains this element of divine mercy. In God there is incredible clemency and forgiveness. You find the same word in verse 5 but in verse 5 it's translated as mercy. Your mercy O Lord is in the heavens or we might say it reaches up to the sky. It's reminding us of one of the Principles by which God deals with men and women and boys and girls. He deals with them in terms of pity, clemency. Mercy is the way we deal with those who have wronged us and who have no claim upon us, whatever. They've hurt us, they've abused us, they've fought, uh, forfeited all right for us to take any notice of them. They've offended us and so we can just ignore them and uh, here now is God exercising mercy who've, to people who've offended against his law who've ignored him they're criminals they've got no excuse for what they have done they don't have a word of defense for their actions they are guilty before God and yet he meets them with mercy that's our status before God the whole world the scripture says lies guilty before God. That's the plight of every unbelieving, unrepentant man and woman before their creator and judge. That's their status. That's their condition individually and personally. But the loving kindness of God means that he never, he never allows that fact that we deserve, we deserve uh, punishment and judgment he never allows that fact to regulate and determine the way he deals with us. But he deals with us in a way that is completely and utterly different from anything we might expect of him. You see it in the fall with uh, Adam and Eve when they first sin and rebel against God. That he refuses to allow their guilt and rebellion to determine that from that moment... 
he will only deal with them in strict justice. And then later you see the whole history of Israel. We read some of it, didn't we, from Nehemiah in chapter 9 earlier. How that uh, in the whole history of Israel, from the judges, the period of the judges, through the history of the kings of Israel and, and Judah, uh, it was a history of rebellion, of idolatry, of ingratitude to God, of apostasy, and yet God does not deal with them in terms of righteousness alone. Psalm 130 verse 7 says, Let Israel wait upon the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy and abundant redemption. See the same thing in the experience of David, the king. You remember how great a king he was, and yet how evil a man he was. And you see his lust, and his barbarity, and his murder in his sin against Uriah and Bathsheba, his exposure, his conscience being overwhelmed with the enormity of his guilt. But David doesn't say, does he? Well, there's no hope now for someone like me. He dares to go to God and he asks God for forgiveness. And he says to God, don't, please don't let the vile way I've behaved determine the way that you will deal with me, but let what I've done not be the defining feature. Don't, don't, Lord, hold that as the basis on which you deal with me. And so on one hand, David is very conscious of what he deserves before God, and yet he casts himself on the measureless mercy of God because that mercy can deal with him in ways uh, determined not by what he deserves, but by the love and the compassion of God. But then to see the vastness of God's mercy, we have to go to another place, don't we? And we go to Calvary where men took the Son of God and they drove nails through his hand and through his f hands and through his feet and they lifted him up naked before a jeering crowd to die. And you remember there how from the cross the Lord Jesus pleaded not with them to have mercy on him but with his Father in heaven. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What an amazing Mercy, God forgiving men for killing his only begotten son in such a terrible way. And yet Jesus, knowing he could never pray to God in vain, pleaded for them that they might have mercy. The men who murdered him. And then there's you and me this morning, all of us as we gather today with our own individual records of sins and we think about the past and we think about the things that we have thought and said and the things we've done through our lives and we know we can't change them and we can't rub them out and we can't make up for them and we're thinking well can there be pardon for someone like me after what I've done and what I have been can I compensate for past sins by a future life of of goodness so that there might be mercy for me. But there hanging next to Jesus, on another cross, was a criminal who confessed that he deserved to die as he was dying. And yet he dared to cry to Jesus to ask him to remember him when he came in his kingdom. And Jesus doesn't say to him, well, you've got a hope. You'd be lucky. You are reaping what you've sown. Jesus doesn't say that to him, does he? He says... I won't forget you. I won't forget you. Today you'll be with me in paradise. There is hope in God. There is hope of a mercy that is, as he says here, higher than the heavens. Hope for the very worst if he will cry to God to have mercy upon him. Think of the returning prodigal son as he came home from the far country the legs, the arms, the voice, the, the lips of mercy that ran to him, embraced him, kissed him, called for the fatted calf uh, to be killed, that they might rejoice that this son had returned. Not reproaches, but the warmth of a father's mercy upon his son. That's loving kindness. And then there's loyalty. 
loyalty. The loving kindness of the Lord also contains this element of loyalty, mercy and loyalty. And uh, you find in many translations then that it's, it comes to us as steadfast love because the translators know that the basic meaning of this word hesed is uh, loyalty. The word is usually found in the context of a covenant. God making promises to men. Two men make a covenant. We call it today a contract between two businesses, a treaty between two nations, a solemn pledge between a husband and wife. And when the terms of the covenant are kept, then what you're seeing in action is hesed. If a husband is loyal to his wife, then he is hesed, loyalty there. Fidelity. If a brother is loyal to his brother, again, that is hesed. If a nation is loyal to the obligations of a treaty, again, that is hesed. It is fidelity and loyalty in particular relationships. And in the scripture, God shows that he's made a covenant with mankind. And within the terms of that covenant, God is absolutely predictable. He's made specific promises. He's given definite undertakings. And the scripture assures us he is loyal to those. He will be loyal to all he has promised. He is faithful. He will be steadfast. If you go back to um, Genesis chapter 8, you remember, we have God's covenant with Noah that whilst the earth remains, there would be seed time and harvest, summer and winter, cold and heat, day and night, and so on. They'd never again come upon the earth a calamity of the dimensions of the great flood. It's a covenant that God made with all mankind and with the whole of creation. And to that covenant, to this day, God has remained faithful. Think of his covenant with Abraham and God's covenant with Israel at Sinai that we read of earlier. And then the repeated unfaithfulness of the people of God and their continual apostasies. And yet through it all the Lord remained faithful to his covenant with them even in the face of all their provocations. A few weeks ago we looked at the prophecy of Hosea, didn't we? And uh, there how the unfaithfulness of the people of God was made so plain and clear. Hosea is required to live faithfully and loyalty, loyally with an adulterous wife. And in that prophecy God was driving home the message of God's own loving kindness against the backcloth of uh, the faithlessness and unfaithfulness of his people. Hosea was standing before the people. The disaster of his marriage was known by everyone who heard him and he was pleading with them, can you not see the loving kindness of God? Whatever Israel has done, however unfaithful she has been, our God remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And we know that in our own experience of God don't we in our own relationship with God there's a divine commitment there is a loyalty between God and his church God and his people a covenant love that transcends any other love we might show in this life it's more than the father a father's love for his son it's more than uh, a husband's loyalty to his wife it's more than a mother's devotion to her children this is God's fidelity to his church his absolute loyalty to his people. God continues to hold on to them with a strong love. And he says to us as he did to Israel, how can I let you go? God's faithfulness, his loving kindness. That doesn't mean, of course, that God is indifferent to the way we live our lives. He's not indifferent to what the church does. But it means that God's correction of his people, his rebuking them, his chastening them his discipline is a discipline that takes place within that covenant it's a discipline of loyalty it's a discipline of someone who is absolutely committed uh, so committed that he'll never forsake us nothing we do will cause God to give us up he'll bring us back he'll never disown his people he'll never repudiate 
his covenant. The moment we enter into faith with Christ, that moment we enter into a covenant with God, and in that moment, he makes unbreakable promises to us. It's absolutely astonishing. It's applied to us, it's sealed, it's sealed, it, it uh, becomes firm from that moment and forever. Though my father and my mother forsake me, yet the Lord will not forsake me because of his covenant faithfulness. Life nor death, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which passes knowledge. It doesn't matter what pressure gets put upon me as a Christian, no matter how deeply I might fall or how long a time I might live my life as if I'm divorced from God. The Lord will not cast me off. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is loyal to what he promised. The mercy of God, the loyalty of God, is seen in his loving kindness. And the loving kindness of God also contains this element of kindness. Of course, the very word focuses on that. It is a loving kindness. There is a mercy, there is a loyalty in God, but there's also this astonishing kindness of God and patience and generosity and benevolence. How much kindness? How great is the kindness? To measure divine kindness, you have to see that it is the kindness of a, an almighty God who is infinite, who is eternal, and who is in, unchanging. And everything about him is infinite, eternal, and unchanging. It is God's love for those with whom he is in covenant, for those whose, who, whose God is the Lord, for those who know him, for those who follow him and trust him. It's love for them. The deep, deep love of Jesus focuses on those people. It flows underneath them, all around them. The never-ceasing current of God's faithful kindness and love. The love of God is above the is above all the the um, devotion of God. It is the wholehearted commitment of God to His people. And to every single one of them. He doesn't just see us as some great mass of people that make up his church. He sees everyone. He knows us by name. And flowing out of that love for each individual is this deep, deep kindness of God. Sort of kindness that only strong love can display. And this divine kindness is then joined to omnipotent power. God's kindness is his loving omnipotence unfailingly shown towards his people. Ephesians 5 gives us that picture, doesn't it, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for the church, and we are told that he nourishes and cherishes his bride, the church. That's what loving kindness does. It nourishes and cherishes. There are people who are committed uh, to marriage, just one marriage for life. They would not, under any circumstance, consider divorce. And yet, all the affection has gone out of their marriage. It's a marriage in name only. It's just a formal thing. Well, it's never like that with God. Never. He is married to us, but it's not a mere formal arrangement. But he is showing perpetual kindness to his bride. He is constantly nourishing constantly cherishing the church, his people, at every point of their lives. His kindness always controls what he does for us and in us. God is even now positively nourishing and cherishing every one of his people. You this morning, right now God is nourishing you and cherishing you. Christ himself is the measure of the length to which divine love will go. He is the measure of what being kind means to God. Of course, God's loving kindness also makes demands as well, makes demands upon the people of God, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and 
Walk in love. So we are to be characterized also by this great divine love of God, this kindness of God. It's to be seen in our kindness to our families and kindness to other people in the congregation and kindness to our neighbors. Kindness. Remember how Peter exhorts and exhorts us in his second epistle to be diligent to add one virtue after another to our lives and one of the virtues he mentions is brotherly kindness make sure he says you're adding to your life day by day kindness deeds of love and patience and thoughtfulness some of us will remember um, Derek Swan uh, telling us of a preacher he once knew and he had noticed that whenever this man prayed, whenever he led his congregation in prayer, he would begin with the words, Our kind and loving Heavenly Father. And one day Derek asked him why he always referred to the kindness of God. And he told Derek that he had once been the pastor of a church that was chiefly characterized by backbiting and criticism, that there was a bitter spirit in the church and that everyone was fragile and tense they're all watching their back they knew that any failing would be met with criticism and he was determined not to give in to that spirit and so he determined that every lord's day he would confront the people with the kindness of god god's loving kindness then it has these principal elements of divine mercy divine loyalty divine kindness and that's the loving kindness that is displayed it's seen it's immeasurable loving kindness we're told god's loving kindness he says in verse 5 reaches to the heavens in other words it's beyond our power to grasp and to comprehend it's as high as you can see and then higher still it reaches to the most remote stars in space and further still. And from the heights of glory, that loving kindness has been focused down upon us. It's the loving kindness that homed in on Lot and on Jacob and on David and on the prodigal son and on the apostle Paul. And then on us. It is love that reaches down from heaven comes right down into the fearful pit and into the miry clay and then with tender hands it lifts us up out of that god spared us nothing not even his own son to achieve that his loving kindness is immeasurable it is infinite and he tells us here it is precious it is precious loving kindness he says in verse 7 how precious is your loving kindness O god and in his mind He's thinking then about the things that really matter, the things we really should have as things of first importance in our lives, the things we should value above everything else. What is the pearl of great price? What is the thing for which I would willingly give up everything I possess? What is it that is worthy of my loyalty and my total commitment? David says, the most precious thing is to be loved by God's unfailing love, his tender mercies. How precious is God himself that he loves us as he does, that he loves me. There's nothing as priceless, says David, as God's unfailing love for his people. That's the loving kindness that surrounds us on every side. And it's a protecting loving kindness. David says there's just one safe place in the world and that is finding refuge and the sh under the shadow of his wings those who would destroy us can't touch us there that's a wonderful thing and one of the most wonderful things about it is that there's no price to be paid to enter there we may enter that place freely it's access accessed as the prophet says without money and without price who can find themselves in the refuge of the loving kindness of the Lord. How does he describe them there in verse 7? He just says they are the children of men who trust. So, the trusting peasant woman 
in China planting rice today, the banker on Wall Street doing his trades, the army chief of sta staff making his plans, the children of men, all sorts, can find refuge under the shadow of his wings in the loving kindness of God. They're all invited to come, every one, the children of men. And this is the loving kindness that is offered to you this morning and to me. The world is full of pressure and stress, isn't it? Full of danger and so much stuff that we can hardly cope with. And so soon do we find that we come to the end of our tether. What are you going to do then? Where do you go then? David says, find refuge under the shadow of his wings. Go to God for strength to endure. Go to God for strength to contend. Go to God and find refuge in him. So close to him that you are actually under his shadow, he says. Get that close to God. Why should we do that? Well, we do it because of his loving kindness. We don't do it because we deserve it. We don't do it because we feel worthy of God. Men go to God because he is there and because he is a God of loving kindness. You might be the most ordinary person you heard this morning. Perhaps there's nothing outstanding or exceptional about you and maybe at times that gets you down. Perhaps you, you sometimes are fed up and disappointed that you are so ordinary. Well, you can come and take refuge under the shadow of God's wings. Refuge in Jesus Christ and you'll find there every kind of person in the, in the world, this worldwide, who've similarly found, found refuge there. People who found difficulty in coping with life find refuge there. People who want to cope better find refuge there. People who are the high flyers, people high and low find refuge there. God doesn't deal with any of them as they deserve. And we can come to God then because of his loyalty, his commitment to his promise. We come to God, the God of loving kindness, because he never abandons men. He never lets his people go. He never breaks a promise. He is a God of steadfast love, of constant loyalty. We can trust him. And above all, generosity. The great goodness and generosity of God. He forgives sinners. He gives freely to them a new heart. He clothes them with the righteousness of Christ. He preserves them. He helps them. He keeps them. He blesses them with every spiritual blessing. He is the God who does more for his people than ever they can do for him. He is a God who has given his only begotten Son to be their saviour. He's given the Holy Spirit to indwell them. And so we come to this God to find refuge under his wings because of his loyalty, because of his generosity. David, you remember, made such a mess of his life that he comes to God and he says, Lord, cover it. I don't ever want it mentioned. I never want to talk about it again. I don't want it be to be brought back. I want it to be put into the depths. And so he comes to God and he says, according to your loving kindness, O God, have mercy on me. Because of your generosity, O Lord, forgive me. And God heard his cry. The Lord has a heart that is so tender, so loyal, a heart so generous and forgiving that even if today your life is in the biggest shambles anyone could ever imagine, you can still go to God and you can ask him to bless you with his own loving kindness. You can go to God and expect him to be loyal to every promise he makes. Some people are, some people say that they're anxious to be right with God but they feel they have to make themselves better first, special. That as they are, they're too ordinary to come to God. They have to improve themselves. They have to prepare themselves before they stand before the Almighty uh, to make themselves better. But I, I want to tell you this morning, everyone who has ever come to God comes kneeling, 
before him, asking him to forgive them for everything they've been and for the way that they are at that moment that they come to him. Every Christian, everyone wishes they were more sincere, that they had more conviction and more faith and more desire for God. Every Christian feels like that. But when they came to God, every one of them was unprepared for that because there is no preparation you can make to come to God. We come to find refuge under the shadow of his wings. We are to come to him saying, I need you, Lord, to protect me. And then what do you ask God after that? What's the next request you make? Did you notice in this psalm, as I read it earlier, there is only one request? There's only one petition in the whole psalm, and it's in verse 10. Oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you. That's the only request he makes. In other words, he's saying to God, go on loving me. Give me more of the same. Please don't stop loving me for a minute, not for an hour, not for a day. Go on loving me. Go on protecting me. Go on keeping me. I can't keep going in the Christian life. That's a fact. I can't do that. Loving God with all my heart and loving my neighbour as myself, I can't live like that in my own strength. I can't do that alone. So we're saying, Lord, come to me in all your loving kindness. Continue your love to me and to all those who know you. Continue to love us. Help us all by your loving kindness, which is better than life. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light, he says in verse 9. Let me drink of the fountain of your loving kindness all the days of my life and see the glorious shining light by the light you give to me in your loving kindness. Jude in his epistle says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Well, how do you do that? By looking for the mercy of of our Lord Jesus Christ and to eternal life. God enable us to do that today by the power of his spirit and word.